The Southeast African country of Mozambique, stretching over some 310,000 square miles, is the world's 36th largest. A former Portuguese colony, the country experienced a violent and turbulent past. The Independence War, 1964 to 1974, was followed by a 15-year civil war in 1977. During this time, the economy and infrastructure of the country was ravaged, and by the time the conflict was over, it was one of the world's poorest. Since 1993, the country has followed a multi-party political system with a market-based economy. Economic recovery has been slow, but the country has huge potential for growth in the agricultural, mining and tourism sectors. Protected wilderness areas in Mozambique are known as conservation areas and are categorized according to their land use. Within national parks, national reserves and forest reserves, no consumptive utilization of natural resources is allowed. Sustainable consumptive utilization is permitted in community wildlife utilization areas, private game farms and state hunting areas, which are known as kutadas. Kutada 11 is situated in central Mozambique, approximately 30 miles inland from the coast. Sections of the area lie within the Zambezi River Delta. Prior to 1974, this 500,000 acre hunting block was one of Africa's finest. Mark Haldane of Zambezi Delta Safaris is the current lessee of Kutada 11. What is so unique about Kutada 11 is it has a very varied habitat. We have the dense sand forest, Miombo woodland, tropical savanna, floodplains right into swamps. So it's given us an extremely varied wildlife population from the little Livingston Sunni all the way through to buffalo and elephant and everything in between. During Mozambique's protracted war, the security situation made safari hunting impossible. Anarchy reigned as wildlife across the country was decimated. The region became a butchery to feed the troops on both sides of the war. The local bushmeat trade also thrived. Buffalo populations that were estimated to be in the region of 45,000 fell to around 1,200. Waterbuck numbers shrank from 100,000 to 2,500. Species such as sable, hartebeest, eland, nyala and zebra were just about wiped out. When Zambezi Delta Safaris took over Kutada 11's hunting lease in 1992, the area was almost devoid of life both human and animal. All the villagers moved out of the area and moved into the bigger towns around for protection. So the small animals like Sunni, Blue Diker, Red Diker, that weren't worth a bullet, thrived even throughout the Civil War. But all the bigger herbivores, the buffalo, the sable, the eland, they were absolutely slaughtered to feed all the troops. Katada 11 is a very well-known Katada. Prior to the war, the likes of Harry Manners, Werner van Alvonschleich and all hunted the area. They also battled with poaching back in those days. The consumption of bushmeat has always been an integral part of the culture of the people across the spectrum. From the rural farmer to the city dweller, it is believed to have magical healing properties. So it's not a new problem and it's not a problem that's just going to go away. When we took possession of the Katada, we had very few villages in it, but slowly they've crept in. Strictly under law, we're not meant to have any people in the area. We're not going to get rid of them. It's far too political for someone to come in and remove a thousand people. With a lot of grit and determination, Zambezi Delta Safaris began to rehabilitate the hunting area. Mark realized that a full-time anti-poaching unit would have to be employed. Ex-poachers make the best game rangers, and Mark started his unit with five resident ex-poachers. They were sufficient to suppress most of our poaching in the area. As the game has increased, so has the threat of poaching. So our unit has had to evolve from there. We slowly built up to 10, then 15, then 20 rangers. In Katara 11 itself, we see very little, if any, rifle poaching. It's predominantly gin traps and cable snares. The commercial bushmeat trade is where our biggest problem is. This is some of the villages within our area, but predominantly 
It's local people from outside that come in, poach and go out with the meat which they sell. Same methods, gin traps and cable snares which they use. Craig Vint is Zambezi Delta Safari's anti-poaching team leader. The main parts that are made up of a gin trap are the car spring and then they also use the part of a railway line which adds to the weight so when it catches the animal it's heavier to drag so that they can find the animal easier. If you have a look at these traps you'll see that there's you get a big long spring and those normally come from Maramia and then you get a nice shorter one with another smaller spring inside and those normally come from Nyaminga. So yeah you can almost sort of backtrack where they come from. Once they've made their gin trap they'll take it to an area where they've got a nice root and then they'll get a nice big log that they'll cut down and uh, open up the gin trap. They'll find a game trail. They'll now dig a nice hole. They'll bury the gin trap set inside there. Uh -huh. And then once the animals walk past and it catches itself, It'll drag the heavy gin trap around through the bushes, get caught in the bush and what, the poacher will come along, follow all the drag marks and then um, obviously spear the animal. You need quite a few people to set these things so you can imagine the amount of pressure that's gone on an animal's foot, even a human's foot. One of our main dangers to our anti poaching is uh, if, if one of my guys is just standing on one of these traps. And fortunately um, the poachers they leave some sort of clue to where their gin traps are. And some of those clues would be leaving a log just before and after the gin trap or either they leave two sticks on either side of it cut, you'll see them marked clearly. Sometimes they don't put anything and you'll have to find the pile of sand that they take out and replace it with a gin trap. You'll find that pile of sand uh, just a few meters off from the trap and those are the main keys that we look for to find a gin trap. <laughs> The, probably the main reason why they use these gin traps is to preserve the animals so that the meat doesn't rot when they've gone home and their traps are still in the bush. So when they get there the animal is still alive so that they can go and kill it and they've got fresh meat still. Another form of them catching animals is by using a whip snare which also catches the animal by its legs so that also sort of pres uh, preserves the animal so that it doesn't die straight away or get strangled to death and uh, we're just going to set one here and show you how it's all done Our uh, anti-poaching unit are, are all salaried staff, they're all on a permanent basis. The majority of them are guys that were poachers and we make it a point that when we do need to replace someone or bring someone new in, where possible if he's a known poacher and we feel we can turn him and work with him, he's our first choice. In addition to their salary, they do get a reward for what they produce, particularly the um, gin traps. They get paid a, a, a little less than what it costs to manufacture one and we in turn sell these gin traps to our clients who want to put them in their, in their trophy rooms and, and help fund some of the operations. Humanitarian operations for the protection of elephants have facilitated some fantastic training. They have brought in an American anti-poaching expert. He's come out three times and trained our unit, been of a great help. Mark's team is quite frankly is the model for the way ahead in the various areas and the investments he's made of his own money, his own time. They, they do a very good job of what they're doing, actually an excellent job. All I'm here to do is to kind of polish them a little bit because in every operating cycle there's a, there's a continuing evolution, find, fix and finish, you know, and so the faster you get around that loop, the more successful you are and the more efficient you are with the limited resources that you have. And that's what I'm here to do. I bring some lessons learned, bring a little bit of off-the-shelf technology, very basic but robust, and then uh, applying that at the certain points of friction so we can kind of get them more efficient, a little more polished. You got, you, you're controlling this space, you're controlling that space. We have a natural terrain barrier here, and not only that, Mark will be in an orbit in about a 500 meter orbit around the area. 
two and a half years ago, we started using a helicopter. It's a light two-seater Robinson helicopter, very cost-effective, and we patrol with it. Uh, we normally have a patrol in the air with the motorcycle unit on the ground and the uh, foot patrol. And working together, they've, it's been absolutely revolutionary. All right, I'll tell you what. We met three out of the four of our objectives on the mission. Infield successfully. The blocking and containment was set. Communication was strong. We had containment on both flanks. Pursuers in the middle or the most likely avenue to push them out. Egress, ingress out of the helicopter with weapons. Actually, I'd give it 95% mission success using this template. Found the target exactly where we were looking for. Yeah. It looked exactly like what I thought it was going to look like. And it just, and it looks like they were in prep. I had two cut poles and then I was oh, yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. You guys got some wire snares. These fellows got some wire snares. So I think, you know, bravo, well done. Just use the same template, just modify it. Yep. But it's absolutely critical everybody be able to talk to each other. Yeah. And 100%. having Mark as a relay was money. Yeah. And Mark actually, if there had been poachers, he would have held them in place till we got in position. He didn't pull off until we literally were at the target. Yeah. So it's all good. As we've evolved to try and keep ahead of the poachers, the poachers too have evolved as well. In the early days, big gang of poachers, eight to 10 guys would come in, they'd cut a snare line, and they'd set a snare in every gap. They have a few chaps that will bring them supplies and take the meat out, which we refer to as the transporters. The bush meat is sold smoked, and this is what the market uh, dictates. They'd have a, a smoking rack right there in the middle of the concession. In the old days, they would have a smoking fire going 24-7, with one old chap staying in camp to tend the fires. They physically have to smoke that meat, otherwise it'll all go rotten. A light aircraft is used for regular patrols to look for poachers camp smoke. Increased surveillance has made the poachers warier, forcing them to smoke the meat at night. Just at sunrise is the best time to look for remnants of the night fires from the air. The pilot is in radio contact with a ground unit and where necessary, a small helicopter is used for swift deployment of rangers. Foot patrols are sent out every week to different parts of the Kutada to gather information and track down poachers. One of the most important things that they do is they lay ambush on the, on the footpaths. This is normally over the full moon phase of about a week. During that time we find the transporters are a lot more active and they normally transport the meat anything from 10 at night until 3 or 4 in the morning. Historically they always came in on bicycles and uh, they loaded those bicycles up with a good 50 pounds of meat. Recently there's been a whole revolution of motorcycles arriving in Mozambique, cheap Chinese motorcycles. They're using these more often than not now, which is good and bad. They're quicker to going in and out, but from a good side when we catch a transporter, and we hold his motorcycle as collateral and hold it, hand it over to the authorities, they're losing a lot more than they were purely by losing a, uh, a bicycle. So one of the main ways the poachers transport their meat is at night uh, by using uh, bicycles or motorbikes at night. And so what our plan for is now is we're going to take the into poaching to one of the bicycle pods that lead to Marimia. And uh, they'll stay there the whole night and tomorrow morning we'll go and collect them and see what they've got. So we've come to pick up my anti-poaching here in the morning. Well, we've got one poacher, he's, he had his nice motorbike. And unfortunately, another two poachers are on foot coming along this path and um, they spotted the anti-poaching and they dropped all their meat and ran away. That's pretty unfortunate. There's, I don't think there's any step to take forward of getting those poachers, but we'll definitely go and see where he's bought his meat or if he was the actual poacher. This is how you tell it's been caught by a gin trap. See how the Oh, it's broken its leg here and all these pieces of skin. We've got this guy that's bought meat from this village here. And so he's going to show us where um, he's bought all of his meat. So what we're going to do now is we're going to walk on the edge of the forest because it's quite open there so they might see us. We'll walk on the edge of the forest and when we get close to his house then we'll obviously see if he's there or not and make a move from there. Get on our way. 
way to this village now we found a few snares so we went and took them out now we're on our way back to the village where this guy's caught this meat from you see obviously got the message that uh, we had caught this guy and he's hiding out here he doesn't want to go to his house and so if we had gone straight to his house we wouldn't have caught him because we wouldn't have known he was here but by coming around this way we would have caught him Okay, so what's happening here now is um, we've caught this guy that we're after and he's agreed, he said yes, he did buy meat from me but when he got here he had meat on the back as well so he didn't really buy from this poacher so, so now we want to know where else he bought meat from. Okay, so this is how they preserve some of the meat, the smaller animals, is they, they sort of butterfly it and then they'll tie it to a stick and put it next to the smoke and fire and just cook it slowly, smoke it to preserve it. And uh, we picked up a skin just now from uh, near one of the Sunni snares and obviously they caught this baby bushbuck. Last year um, I did a count of 104 gin traps, 1,227 snares and 127 poachers. One of the negativities of our success is that the population of animals is virtually at capacity now. And it stands to reason that a poacher would far rather poach in a game rich area than an area devoid of game. So the more game we get, the more the poachers sit on our boundaries, like hungry hyenas wanting to come in. We have to continually evolve and stay ahead of the threat. With the increasing effectiveness of the anti-poaching team, the poachers have had to adjust their tactics. The areas around waterholes are the best place to set traps and snares, especially as the water recedes towards the end of the dry season. The chances of getting caught in these areas are now high, and so the poachers have had to move further away into the forest. Whilst the anti-poaching efforts have reduced the poachers' success, it now means a larger area of the Kutada has to be patrolled, which adds to the overall operational costs we created a fast reaction motorcycle unit. This is five ranges on bush bikes, and they are virtually able to get to any corner of our Katara, with the exception of the swamps, within 30 to 45 minutes. So if a professional hunter comes in and says, I've just seen fresh tracks on a footpath, they can be there within 45 minutes. The other thing about them is they are able to follow the footpaths which a normal land cruiser or vehicle cannot get into. All right, so we've come out this morning. Um, we've actually used the motorbike because we've gone through a few single tracks and because it's so remote out here. Um, the poacher told us that he had a gin trap out here, so we've come here and uh, we're about to go and get his gin trap. Okay, we've left our motorbike from the road and he's brought us into this uh, forest. And I can see clearly that there's a gin trap over here underneath this palm tree on a, on a game path. So we're going to take it out now. You see this here? Um, I don't know how the sable missed it, but check, he has a fresh sable track here that's come past this path. I don't know how it didn't catch it, but thank goodness it didn't. We have a system of a tribal court, which we use particularly for first offenders. A tribal court isn't something that we've developed. It's a system that falls under the judicial system of Mozambique. As a Mozambique citizen, you have a right to be tried in a tribal court. You also have the right to refuse it and to go through the main judicial system. The tribal court is hosted by elders of the tribe and it's normally pretty fair that you're not going to get a huge sentence out of it. A poacher with his first offence will probably get 14 to 21 days labour. He will be handed back to the Katada and we'll use him for something within our conservation uh, site, opening up of roads or trails. Uh, digging out water holes during a dry season, something along those lines. Ivory poaching in the Delta has not been a large problem until probably the last 12 months. We've seen more elephants in the last 12 months uh, that have been poached than we have in the last 10 years. Funny enough, all the elephants in Katadi 11 we found that have been poached have still had the ivory in, which is strange. But what we work out it relates to is these elephants are being poached outside of our borders because of our anti-poaching unit within our borders and they are coming into our area and and into the swamps which is their safe haven and dying there 
And it's because they are poached with light caliber rifles, in this case AK-47, and most of them are just dying of their injuries at a late stage. We used to operate our anti-poaching unit seasonally. We're now there 12 months of the year. The only time we actually close down is over Christmas and New Year for a period of 10 days. But apart from that, we have a presence with leadership throughout the entire year and our patrols operate throughout the whole year. A unit like I'm running, unfortunately, comes with considerable cost. It costs us about $100,000 to $120,000 a year to run. We've been very fortunate. We've had a lot of outside help. It's always hunters or hunting organizations or companies that are related to hunting. Our biggest financial contributor has been Dallas Safari Club. They single-handedly finance the helicopter, which costs us about, around about $50,000 a year to keep in the air. Just absolutely amazing help from guys that, that hunt with us. You know, end of their safari, give us $5,000 here, $10,000 there. Every year there is a shortfall, sometimes a little more than others, and uh, ourselves as Zambezi Delta Safaris make up whatever shortfall there is. Our anti-poaching unit has been operating, I would say, at a professional level for 15 years. And we've been going for a good 25 where we've had, had some form of anti-poaching. Over those years, I can honestly say that not one single dollar has come from a non-hunting entity. Winning over hearts and minds is an important part of any anti-poaching program. And during the hunting season, Zambezi Delta Safaris drops off meat from the safari hunted animals to the various villages in the area. We have every village and every household registered in our batata, and this is how we distribute the meat. All right, so this is basically what we call a meat drop. Each village, every two weeks, they'll get a drop off of meat. This is a very important activity for us to do because it then shows them that there's no reason for them to poach here, you know. They are getting the right amount of protein here. And so if we do catch them, they've got no excuse to say no, they're just feeding their family. So if anyone's poaching, then it's commercial. Last year, we handed out 18 tons of fresh meat from the game. In addition to the meat drop, a mobile maize grinding mill is taken from village to village to grind the people's corn for free. A further incentive is that every year, 20% of the revenue generated from the government hunting licenses goes back to the local community. This is a significant amount of money that goes a long way towards community upliftment. There are conditions to these incentives, however. If a villager is caught poaching, his whole village loses their meat allocation and maize grinding service for a month. Probably one of our most, the most important things we do, we've built a school on the fringe of our area. We're trying to naturally attract the villagers to the fringe rather than to the center of our katada. We are in the process of building a clinic at the moment. So we have pretty good relationships with the local community. The recovery of wildlife in Kutada 11 has been spectacular. Since Zambezi Delta Safaris started operating in 1992, the buffalo population in the whole of the Zambezi Delta region has increased from about 2,300 to around 20,000. Sable numbers are now up to 6,000 from a low of 44. It is now one of the greatest concentrations of the species in Africa today. Waterbuck, zebra, hartebeest and other smaller game species have also dramatically increased in numbers. The capacity to generate money through safari hunting enables Zambezi Delta Safaris to invest in the area. If the company is not able to turn a profit, there is no incentive to be there at all. Our game populations have increased incredibly and government has recognized this from our regular game surveys which they host and they have increased our, our quota. Buffalo being probably one of the, the most obvious, we started off with a quota of five buffalo a year and we're now on 65 buffalo a year. One of the really good things about, uh, about having a, a Katada in Mozambique is once you've proved yourself, they'll give you a, a, a long lease. When we started off, it was basically a year to year. Then they increased it to a three year lease, then a five year lease. And I'm now on a 10 year lease with a guaranteed rollover of five years. So in effect, it's a 15 year lease. 
which enables you to really put some decent conservation principles into place and get the whole area turned around. An often posed question is, could photographics replace hunting? I don't believe it would be a viable option here. First of all, we are so remote, the cost of getting here would kill your average photographic safari. We're a good 12 hours drive from Baira, which is our nearest major town. We're a long way from any other tourism type destinations. And secondly, we're in quite a hard environment. If you start looking at marginal areas, thick Mapani forests, which are great for hunting, but no one's gonna be happy driving around for three days to see one elephant's behind. So it's ideally situated for hunting and just too far away to make it viable for ecotourism. Hunting is absolutely essential in the Katadas. There have been a couple of recent examples where companies have had financial issues and have pulled out of the Katadas and virtually within two years the game is all but wiped out there. So in areas like Mozambique which are rural and are not well suited to photographic safaris, the hunting companies are absolutely essential to the comeback and the maintenance of the wildlife in those areas. One of the biggest threats that we have in the hunting industry is not just the poachers, it's also international legislation. Of particular concern are some of the US Fish and Wildlife decisions of late, banning or limiting the importation of certain species, particularly lions. For us to conserve game within our areas, it needs to pay its way. It just isn't viable to try to conserve something that has no commercial value, both from our standpoint and from the Mozambican government. And I believe that's, that's the same situation throughout Africa. We would dearly like to reintroduce lion in our area. They are probably the only species that hasn't come back to its full potential. But one's always a little nervous to do that when they, at the moment, they have very little commercial value because of the the ban of the importation of them into the United States. It's also quite amazing that they haven't consulted with any of us who have been leaders in the field for the last 20 years to come and actually see what's going on on the ground and all the good that is being done by hunting rather than just taking a pen and striking it off the roll and, and actually giving all those animals a death sentence. Through their tireless efforts, an expanse of Africa almost one and a half times the size of the famed Maasai Mara has been rehabilitated. Few people worldwide would have heard of Mark Haldane and Zambezi Delta safaris, as neither they nor the area has media celebrity status. Because safari hunting is vilified by mainstream media, it is likely to remain that way. These true custodians of wilderness have battled and won against tremendous odds. But there is a real and present danger that foreign laws, such as those enforced by the US Fish and Wildlife Service, will be the single factor that eventually defeats them, turning the area back into a desolate wasteland. The US Fish and Wildlife Service claims to support the concept of conservation through hunting, it has no qualms about using money raised through hunting in the USA for its own conservation projects. But it seems that the service believes that Africans can't be trusted with their own wildlife and don't deserve to profit from it as they do from theirs. This eco-imperialistic hypocrisy is simply astonishing. <laughs>